Right, let's go ahead and call the meeting to order. Um, and uh, we've got, I think, all the members except Mr. Long on the committee, and we've got a number of other members, including the chairman, uh, who joined us. Uh, hello. <laughs> and um, Patrice is not here today, so Kyra is going to, is filling in for her, Kyra okay. Boyd, and is going to do the roll call for you. Okay, fire away. Okay, Kyra. Morning. Here. Present. Here. Present. 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 Here. Here. Okay. Um, at the recent meeting that we had, not, not the one Monday, of course, but last month, a uh, number of questions and comments uh, about um, the executive order from the governor related to uh, billing and the staff had recommended that we hold off until uh, October on doing anything at all. Uh, I think there were some concerns and questions about uh, at least we need to have a conversation about that issue. So, uh, Corden has put together an agenda. I think everybody's probably got a copy of that. And uh, the first item is going to be uh, the impacts from the, the executive orders, the governor, and where we are in that process. We'll open it up and just go from there. So, Corden, I'm going to throw it back to you and let y'all okay. bring it up today. Okay, I'm sorry if I seem distracted. Mr. Uh, Long just sent me a um, uh, an email and he's trying to get on. So I'm gonna let um, Mike Stover uh, try to get in touch with him and help him on. And so we'll, we'll keep things rolling. But yeah, so let me, let me share um, my screen. Okay, so today we're, we've got three real th three items to discuss. We're going to talk about the impacts of um, executive orders 124 and 142, and our plan and recommendation to um, start implementing the late fees and penalties again, and also um, disconnects for non-payment. So we want to talk through that. We also want to make some changes to the cross connection control program fees. We made, there were some new regulations that were put into place last year. And if you recall, we had planning and policy meetings where we had to revise our, our, our policies to make sure we were in compliance with the state rules and regulations. And we changed some fees and renewal uh, application and renewal process. So we've, We've got a, more information now than we did about a year ago since that was a new program, and we want to talk through some of those um, those fees and make some adjustments. And then if we um, have time, there's another policy re revision that we need to discuss regarding the resale of water. We will stop at 11, so if we don't um, make it to, to that, then we'll just regroup and do that a, another day. So I'm going to turn it over to Mike Corvisto. I did want to, uh, before we get started, just like I normally do, so the uh, commission members will know who's on the, the call. Um, we do have uh, Damon Duquesne, you heard him, assistant city manager, um, and Kyra Boyd, who's part of our communications team, filling in for Patrice. Mike Corvisto, deputy director, Michael Stover, assistant director, Lisa Saunders, chief financial officer, 
Marilena Jensen Guthold, a city assistant city attorney. We have Tommy McEwen, who's our cross connection control supervisor. He's on the call. And then also uh, Nora Cowan, who's our billing supervisor, uh, billing manager. So she's on the call as well. So with that, I will turn it over to um, Michael, Mike K, as I call him, and he can go over um, our first section. Okay, thank you, Courtney. Uh, good morning, commission members. As Mr. Griffin mentioned, well, we wanted to give you an update on how we've been managing the financial impacts of the pandemic and what we're recommending moving forward based on what we've seen here and what some of our peer utilities are doing. So we did just want to run through the timeline of how of what what has happened uh, from our perspective. On March 13th of 2020, the uh, Winston Oversight County Utility suspended disconnections for non-payment and late fees. Uh, on March 31st of 2020, Governor Cooper subsequently issued Executive Order 124 to do basically the same to cover all utilities in North Carolina. On May 30th, Governor Cooper extended Executive Order 124 via Executive Order 142 until July 29th of 2020. And then on uh, July 30th, the Executive Orders expired, allowing utilities to begin charging late fees and to begin disconnecting for non-payment once again. Um, so some other ways that we address the potential impacts of the pandemic, back in the spring, uh, the commission modified its policy in April to allow the utilities director to suspend disconnects and late fees and penalties in an event of force majeure. Also, given the unknowns associated with the governor's executive orders and those timetables, and as well, as well as the economic and financial impacts of the pandemic, uh, the Winston Oversight County Utilities revenue budget was, we, we put together a conservative uh, revenue budget for FY21 that did not include any revenue from late payments, which was a reduction of $2.3 million. We reduced our anticipated revenue from consumption and our, and to an extent our ability to collect that of about $4 million and then reduce system development fee revenue, $3 million. On the expenditure side, we delayed um, some, some uh, purchases or reduced some requests from our staff. Uh, we've also, as the year has started, we're increasing our scrutiny on operational spending We've also delayed or reduced uh, the scope of pending uh, capital projects. Any questions on that so far? Okay, uh, this is the same slide we showed you all on Monday, but did just want to reiterate that our, our spending is under our budget and under last year for, for the first two months of the year. So that is a, that's a good sign. And then, of course, if you'll go to the next, the, the, on the revenue side, we're, we're seeing, um, we've built we've build, uh, for, for more revenue than we budgeted for the first two months of the year, and we're also ahead of last year's um, revenue pace. So those are both on the expenditure and revenue side, and encouraging signs, but it, it's obviously it's early in the year, so, but we'll, Given how things have been going, we'll take what we can get. And this is the same slide we've been showing you, but did want to just go back through it. From April 1st through August 31st, we have waived $1.6 million in late fees and penalties. The 600, 665000 of that is for the current fiscal year, FY21. We have 14000 past due accounts uh, with a total balance of, of just point of just under 3.6 million in past due billings. Uh, at, at this time last year, we had 1.9 million in past due billings. Um, but from uh, July to August, our past due billing amount increased 118,000. So um, that's that's not a whole a whole lot based on what we we could have been seeing. And our delinquency rate is 24% compared to 9% at this time last year. And we did want to go into the delinquency rate a little bit more with you because we've been showing you this metric for several months now. 
Um, and here's a, a chart to kind of show you how things have been, where, where things have been the past year and a half. And if you, it, the graph shows that over the last year and a half, at any one time, we typically have between six and 10 million in unpaid water and sewer account balances. And you can see the trend since March of 2020 is that our balance is over 60 days, which is the orange, the areas in orange uh, continue to grow, which is where you're seeing that, the 24%, um, which is what we hope to reduce via payment plans and some measures we, we wanna talk with you all about here today. So, some of the things that have kind of slowed us down to try to, to get our, our feet under us is that we have, it's a complicated process to make modifications to our billing system to include the executive order mandates uh, and the continued local measures. We're certainly not the only utility that's facing this issue. We've heard from many others that are also in, that, uh, in this situation, but we've been working through that and we think we've come up with a good solution, uh, which we'll present to you here shortly. Um, Knowing what we're getting ready to get into, we'll likely see a significant increase in customer payment plans, which will add a, a, an additional burden to our city link, utility customer service, billing, and collection staffs over the next six to 12 months. So we'll need to monitor and manage that potential increase to workload as, as, that, as we implement that and it transpires. Hopefully we won't have to do anything, but we did just want to put that out there that it, it may be something we need to be aware of. And so what are, what, what's happening across the state for some of our larger peer utilities? We've got Asheville, Charlotte, Durham, Fayetteville, Greensboro, High Point, and Raleigh here. Uh, the first column there shows that everyone's going to be implementing or has implemented six months payment plans which are mandated by the governor's executive order. Some, such as Raleigh, uh, and uh, Charlotte are doing up to 12 month payment plans. Durham is uh, allowing up to nine months. Uh, the second column with resumption of late fee penalties, most of the utilities have either implemented or are getting ready to reinstitute their late fee penalties. Uh, Charlotte has not chosen to do so. Raleigh is doing that um, in a few days. Then on the, the last column, resumption of utility disconnections, the majority are moving ahead, uh, have moved ahead or are moving ahead with reinstituting disconnections for non-payment with Charlotte and Raleigh, two of the, two of the larger utilities in the state, uh, choosing not to implement disconnections, re-implement disconnections at this time. Um, So what we're recommending is to begin uh, our payment plans in October, which we would, we would do a, propose a nine month duration to kind of split the difference between the six and 12, which aligns very well with our fiscal year. We could, we could wrap up most of them prior to the end of June. We would advertise and notify our customers via the website, social media, postcards, letters, have CityLink on uh, prepared to um, have a dialogue with customers we would also be providing information regarding payment assistance programs. Uh, Experiment and Self-Reliance is our local community action agency that receives some federal funding for rent and utility relief for those impacted by the pandemic. We already, that's something we, we direct folks who have problems paying their, their water and sewer bills to regularly, but they have additional funding now, so we will just continue to direct them folks there, uh, if they meet the, the requirements to get assistance, then Experiment Self-Reliance will, will be able to help them with their utility bills. We're proposing to reinstitute late fees in October. We believe that some customers are, are able to pay their bills, but are not necessarily, they don't have an impetus to at the moment, and we think that late fees will encourage customers to pay what they can, and also to set up a payment plan uh, as well. And then we were looking to uh, reinstitute uh, terminations for non-payment in, in January. Uh, 
why not right now? Well, we're, we're looking to give the customer some time to get some momentum and make progress towards making down their balances. And it also gives us a little bit of time to make sure our processes are working properly so that we're not out there um, causing any confusion for our, for our customers or for our staff um, during that time. Okay, that was a lot of me talking. That's Thank you, Mike. Um, Courtney, is Dwayne on yet? Yeah. Please. Okay. I'm here. Okay, good. Any any questions from any of the uh, members of the committee? It, it looks reason, reasonable to me. Yeah, I, I think so too. I had a quick question. Um, what do you, and this, this is probably a, a difficult to kind of answer, but in general, persons that are not able to pay their bills, do you have some idea of the average bill that's out there that's, you know, they're not able to pay? And the only reason I ask is that if, depending on what that amount is, by the time you add on the back payment and then new bills, you know, how is that, is it realistic that they're gonna be able to pay it, I guess? Right, well, and that's, and that's part of why we kind of split the difference between the six and, and 12 months, Mr. Curtis. We, we haven't necessarily looked at the, at the balances. Uh, we did do some quick math, and um, the, I think the average, if you took what, what's past due and the number of accounts, it's in the $300 range. So uh, we, we want to work with the, with the customers, and I think having getting the ball rolling and getting that dialogue going is going to going to help us and them. Uh, we understand that there are a number of people that are still going to have trouble paying their bills, and but from what we've seen, and you know, basically we're not allowed to, we're not in a position where we can forgive any of the charges that people have accrued either during the pandemic or since. So we need to collect that and we're trying to do this in the most, I think, sure. reasonable and, and logical way that we can, but we do know that we're gonna, we're going to have to end up working with, with folks to, to make it work for, for all of us. Okay. In, in, a, in a, a question, in, in a non-COVID year, uh, uh, 2019, for instance, how many people would we cut off in a typical year for non-payment? That's a great question, Mr. Long, and I, I do not have that information uh, in front of me. It is, we have, um, typically we see a, well, a number of folks who we cut off more frequently than others, um, and then there are uh, a number of folks that periodically once a year we'll end up cutting off um it is a it is a fair it is a fair number i, I, I but i do not have that okay there's we can there's get some. To that number. Yeah. apologize that's not that's okay so so basically with this plan with the nine month plan it 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 ends up looking like maybe a person would end up paying a third more of a bill than they normally would is that kind of what i'm saying here Yes. I think, um, depending on the bounce, go, oh, sorry, sorry. Sorry, um, Mike, I was just, when you look at it, if they had about $300 and you divide that over nine months, you're right, you're, it's about $33 a month. And then, you know, an average bill for a customer, by monthly bill, mm -hmm. um, we're, we're saying is about $100 every two months. So mm -hmm. they would pay $33 every month plus that $100 mm -hmm. every other month to kind of keep current. Right, okay, all right. Thanks, Courtney. This is Harold. I got a question, and this is not probably a popular statement, but how long would Spectrum let somebody have TV at their house before they turned it off? And that's a, a luxury, not an necessity like we are. <laughs> Under, understood, Mr. Day. Um, I, and I think that's a, that's that's out there on the table um you know we're in a we're in a position where we can you know reinstitute the the terminations sooner terminations for non-payment sooner um 
we just based on the 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 environment that we're all living and working in, we were we were proposing something that hopefully is is reasonable and works well for both our customers and us. And that by the end of with this plan by the end of June, hopefully we have recouped the vast majority of those delinquent balances as we head into the new fiscal year. Hey Mike, it's Chris Parker. Could you flip back to the previous screen showing what the other municipalities are doing? Um, so the other major municipalities are resuming disconnects uh, August, September, October. Most of them look like they have already instituted except for Raleigh and Charlotte. Correct. Other, yes, yes. Other than Greensboro, which is coming. Yes. Um, and I'll just add and to we're that. We're talking about January. Do you have any idea what Charlotte and Raleigh are looking at? So what we've what we've seen from both of them is they they're not. It would be from what we understand now January at the earliest, but they're they're still working through. I would say some billing system issues some political, working through the political side of things. And so that is that is part of why, from our perspective, I think the, the January timetable um, makes makes sense to try to get the, get the payments, payment plans rolled out, um, and reinstitute late fees, which is an impetus for, if you haven't been paying your bill, you're not gonna wanna start paying late, late fees you'll come in and either pay your delinquent balance or set up a payment plan. And then once you get on your payment plan, get your legs underneath you. Hopefully that carries you to the end of June. If it doesn't, in January, we begin disconnecting and having to um, find other ways to collect those balances from the folks that are having trouble um, paying their, meeting their payment plans. So Mike, in the CARES Act and the billion plus that the state just put a bill through for, there's nothing to help people pay for utility disconnects? Yes, there, there, is, um, there is supposed to be some additional funding. Uh, the, for, at the local level, I believe there's been a small amount. There was 26 million initially allocated to the community action agencies that ha has been distributed and folks are able to use, but it's for rent and, util and utility payments. There is an additional, um, I wanna say closer to $100 million that is supposed to also be available for rent and utilities, but how that is going to be allocated and dispersed is, is yet to be determined. And we will be monitoring that and uh, also communicating that out as best we can once we have some visibility as to how, how the state plans to, to manage that. Well, my concern would be is if it's statewide dollars versus allocated to certain communities, if we push these dates back, then the other municipalities, their customers are gonna be able to grab that money quickly while we're you know, delaying what we're doing. And I certainly wouldn't want to put us behind like Greensboro um, and being able to access those dollars for our customers. Good point. Well, would it maybe the answer to that, Chris, is that um, as we determine what the state's going to do about the allocation of this hundred or so million, um, if in fact we find out that they're going to look at those dates that they're starting back up, then maybe we have to come in and readjust ours at that point in time. To, uh, I mean, if you're going to lose out on the money because everybody else is starting earlier than you are, then maybe we need to reconsider later on. Mr. Chairman, I have a question. Um, have we felt any pressure from anyone yet about the resumption of utility disconnections or resumption of late fee penalties? or has it even come up on anybody's screen yet? For example, the city council. Uh, Damon? Is 
he he got kicked off a minute ago. I don't know if he's back on or not. Well, Courtney, uh, have, have you, have you and Dana so, had a conversation about that? Uh, so, um, I would say not specifically. I mean, you know, there's been discussions about it was addressed at, at one of the council me meetings, making sure that we monitor it and we don't have um, a lot of outstanding payments and, and delinquency and want to make sure that we stay on top of it because it is it is going to become a challenge for us if we're if we don't address it at some point. Um, but I would say we haven't really gotten or received a lot of pressure or either way, other than the discussions that we have, you know, the utility commission has had regarding we need to put a plan in place and do something. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. I'm, I'm glad to know there's been no pressure yet. There, there will be pressure when, when these things are announced. Right. One of the things that I suggested before, and uh, I'll suggest again, on, on the next slide, it talked a little bit about advertising and marketing. One of the things that I wanna make sure that we add to that is we should clearly communicate the 1.6 million that has been waived. You know, we're not just looking to make people's lives, lives miserable. We've actually done some things to help people. And I think it's a good way to, it, it, it still doesn't make the message easy for people who, who might face disconnection, but it does say to the community that we have been proactive in trying to address the concerns that we know about. Point. Alan, I would, I, I would assume that whatever utility commission approves would be uh, advertised to the full extent of our ability to be able to get our paying customers to understand where we're headed in this whole process, I would think. Yes. I, I agree with you. I just don't want to take it for granted. I just want to make uh -huh. sure that. Right. If I could ask uh, Courtney or Mike a question, this is Chris Parker. Um, if let me kind of understand if somebody is on a payment plan and they're keeping up with their payment plan they wouldn't be disconnected just because they haven't paid everything square by january is that right correct correct it would we would basically once january comes around and you're and you're not able to meet your payment plan you would be potentially subject to having your water turned off uh, until you could make that payment. So it sounds like the, the, I'll say the carrot and the stick on this, the stick on this is you need to get in a payment plan before January or you're going to face termination, disconnection. Correct. Well, I, I think what, Mr. Parker, what's going to happen is we want to set up these payment plans in October and give people some time to get going. But yes, once, if we, if, what our intent was for in January, basically anyone who's on a payment plan or, or can't pay their current balance because um, you know, there will be also folks, or that don't pay their current balance, I should say, um, that we would be able to go back out and turn their water off for, for non-payment. Um, so, so Mike, once somebody gets on a payment plan, are they still gonna be faced with the late fees and penalties? Um, for their current balances, for their for balances that accrue after the executive order, potentially yes. Um, if they're late, if they're delinquent in making those, but not for what is on the um, not for the piece that was accrued during the um, executive order. Not what they're paying back. This the is honest. Harold. This is Harold again. I got another thing we need to think about. You know, here it is chilly this morning, but. You know, by late October, November, people are going to turn their heat on. And that's another utility bill they're going to have that's not even considered right now. That's right. Yes. And the, and the CARES Act funding that we've seen, just to reiterate, is, is for all utilities and also um, rent. Tell folks who are delinquent or behind on their rent as well. Any more questions? Tom, I, 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 I've got one in terms of timing. This this uh, committee today, if we uh, approve this to take it to the full commission, 
and this thing starts in October, we're going to need a commission meeting right. to approve it for October 1 begin. Courtney? So, um, sorry, Damon just walked in the room. He, he was not able to rejoin us, so he's going to sit here and listen. Um, the question was, are we going to have to take this back to the utility commission to, for approval? Was that the question, Mr. Long? That's the question. Yeah. So the answer is, the answer is no. This is, there's nothing that needs to be taken to the utility okay. commission for approval to the full commission. Um, we will, we want to discuss this at the planning and policy level, and then we'll, we'll really just start implementing our plan based okay. on what we discussed today. Well, I would assume we'd take a vote on the committee anyway. Yes, yes. I th that's the reason we were going to have this. So it's really the consensus of the, the committee as far as what plan we take action on. So yeah, let, me, okay. let me ask this question. So why would it not go back to the board? So the board, there was approval from the board in April for the director to be able to dis um, I can't remember the exact language, but for force majeure, the director can make the decision to suspend disconnects and late fees. So okay. that was the approval that was needed. Now to kind of reverse that, it's really just the internal sta yeah, uh, staff decision. And just um, in this situation, we are you know working with the planning and policy committee to make sure that we're all on the same page. Marilyn is on the phone, so if I'm saying something that that is incorrect, she can she can uh, let me know. Sure thing. I, I did have one question, Courtney um, and Mike. Um, we we're talking about setting up the payment plans in October. Are we requiring that customers sign up for the payment plans by October, or are we just hoping that customers will sign up by October, but then we allow them to sign up for the payment plan up until January 29th, which is the end of that six-month uh, payment plan period under the executive orders? We'll, no. We're planning to give no. them to give them time. Um, I, I don't think it's reasonable to to assume that everybody's going to be signed up by October. So I, I, we'll work with folks, and if some of this will spill over into the next fiscal year, but our intent was to try to get as much of it as we could handled uh, in the current in the current fiscal year. Uh, but yes, we'll give if if folks can't sign up if we don't get in touch with them until late October or November we will still allow them to uh, get on a payment plan to pay to pay those delinquent balances. But our our hope is that with our outreach, we'll get as many folks as we can in uh, mm -hmm. as early as we can. So got it. I, I agree. I think that's the way to go. Um, uh, permit them to get onto a payment plan through January 29th. So so they have they have six months not to do anything. Is that what you're saying? Uh, is that a question for me, Commissioner? For anybody. <laughs> for anybody. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It, it's it's unclear um, under the executive orders what's required in that regard, but likely um, customers do have that full six month period to get up get set up on a payment plan. So even if they come to us in December or sometime in January. Um, you know, we need to, to let them get set up on a payment plan. Now, the executive orders themselves don't require that we extend the payment plan past January 29, 2020. So under the executive orders, if they came in in December and asked for a payment plan, they'd only have until the end of January 29, 2020. They'd be shortening their own period for the repayment plan. However, we can elect to extend the repayment plan past January 29th, 2020. There's no prohibition on that. So um, so if we want to do a nine-month repayment plan, that's perfectly acceptable. And, um, and you know, in view of circumstances and, and giving customers a, a bit of uh, breathing room. 2020 or 2021? I'm sorry, 2021. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. I wasn't why we were going back in time, but anyway. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Marlena, this is Chris Parker. I, I'm a little bit confused when you're talking about the governor under his executive orders is saying we have until January, January did you say 29th? Mm -hmm. uh, end of January. Yeah. Um, That's right. So if it, the other municipalities are cutting off uh, utilities as early as 
August, September, and October, they haven't allowed people the time to get on a payment plan. So can you explain that? Well, the way I understand it, you can terminate, you can disconnect again after, so the um, EO 142 expired uh, July 29th, which means that utilities can resume disconnections. You can disconnect for um, arrearages that accrued prior to the implementation of the first executive order, so prior to March uh, 30th, 31st, what was that date? Um, and you can disconnect for rearages for non-payment of bills that accrue after the expiration of the executive order, so July 29th. Then you can also disconnect people who get on a payment plan for rearages that accrued while the executive orders were in effect. So somebody gets on a payment plan and they miss a payment, you can disconnect. You can't terminate the payment plan, but you can disconnect the service. Um, you don't, you don't, you can't, um, if somebody doesn't get on a payment plan for the arrearages, then I believe you can disconnect service. You just couldn't disconnect it during the period of the executive order. So the does six that, months, that, well, I'm mm -hmm. still a little confused because you said there's six months to get on the payment plan. Right. Um, so if you have all that time to get on the payment plan, but you don't opt to do it, say in October, the other utilities can disconnect you? Right. Yes. Yes. But you can still come back and say, now I want to get on a payment plan. And um, also, one other thing I wanted to mention is, is, is if somebody does get on a payment plan and they miss the payment and we disconnect them, when they make up that missed payment, then we would have to reconnect them. And how much warning would someone get on a disconnect? Um, Mike or Nora can answer those. Yeah. Our normal process for disconnection. It's, this is more. So our normal process is they get the payment arrangement terms and there is no subsequent notice after that. So if they miss a payment, um, they would the disconnect would be created and then they would get cut off. But part of our plan would be to make sure that they're aware of that up front. And we can certainly look at changing things, but that's that's what the system will currently do. And that's so, for and, a payment plan. For, the, it's a, it's for, the, yeah, for those folks that are not on a payment plan, typically the, we send a termination notice on the 35th day and then um, on day 50, we're out. We're out there terminating. So you have about two a two week notice before we terminate for uh, under normal conditions. So they have close to two months of not paying before they get disconnected. For for normal for your normal bill, but as Nora mentioned, anybody that's on a payment plan that has you know a balance that they're trying to pay down, if you break that payment plan, then there's not the two week notice it immediately triggers the disconnect. Okay, I'm just trying to get clear on how far beyond January, if we decide on January, would actually somebody be disconnected? Right, yeah. I think right. any, and maybe Mike and Nora, because I'm not exactly sure what the billing system would be, but I'm, I'm assuming that anybody that has a bill that comes in after January 1st or that a bill that's due January 1st or later, it would Correct. automatically trigger it. So, you know, maybe two weeks into January, they could be disconnected. Yes. Yeah. Or if they were on a payment plan and it was due January 1st, then it'd be immediate. Yes, and we can work all that out and message that let you all know how the what the logistics of that are, are ultimately going to look like. But if we said as of January one, balances due January one are subject to uh, termination for non-payment, it would be at least two weeks for our, our standard bill, and we're going to work out how we handle that with with a new payment plan for that covers the executive order. But it would likely be the same kind of time frame. Mike, I've got a question about financing. Um, have you have you looked at uh, what 
projects that we're going to have to defer because of the overall loss of income for this whole process that we're going through. And is there anything um, that, that you are, and the team feel is something that we absolutely need to do that you're having to postpone that we've not heard about? Mr. Reverend, I'd yield to Courtney and, and Mike Stover on, on that, but from my perspective, I don't think we've seen anything thus far that would put us in that position as of yet, but we're obviously continuing to monitor that. Okay. Courtney? Yeah, I think we're, we're continuing to monitor our expenditures, as you see, as you saw earlier. Um, capital projects, we have delayed some and reduced scope. so. Um, we and we set our budget, you know, numbers lower than than normal. So we're we're uh, we're continuing to operate under that, um, you know, mode, and it it hasn't. Um, we've been able to continue this method, you know, and 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 it's not been a major concern at this point. Okay. All right. Any other questions? If you ask it, it may just make it more confusing. <laughs> so, so how is the money the, the, from the, the money from the state to help pay for bills? Uh, I guess past two bills. How is that money dispensed? Is it first come, first serve, or is it? I, I believe I believe it is, Mr. Curtis. That that's my understanding is that with the conversation with Experiment and Self Reliance, the, the folks there that. Um, it, it's it's there until you know folks come in and, and use it, and it's all dispersed. So it is it is first come first serve, and, and there you know as we mentioned, it's also for rent, which I think is taking up a lot a lot more of the funding um, than potentially the utility payments. Mike, do you know of other agencies that might have got some of that? For instance, crisis control. Uh, Mr. Long, I, I do not know of any others at, at this time. The when okay. the word came down from the state, it was just going to the community action agent, the local community action agency, which was okay. experimental over life. Now, some some of those other nonprofits do have funding set aside to help people pay their utility bills as well, but it's not any. It's not related to any CARES funding or okay. um, COVID nineteen relief specifically. So, so that in itself really is a is a incentive to go ahead and get started with your payment plan. Yes, and to get that message out there, please set right. up your payment plan. If you're having trouble, reach out to. Yep. Uh, yes. Okay. Okay, um, Courtney. I would think you would want. Uh, uh, approval from the committee i guess we're looking for a, a motion from somebody to um, basically concur in the recommendations yes that, uh, concur uh, or um or revise or you know if you wanted to move the dates up or something um just okay. some this is Dwayne. i would make a motion that we accept the recommendations of the uh, staff for this uh this is Wesley. i'd second it. second that motion Okay, we've got a motion and a second. Um, I guess, Kyra, we need to call the roll and get everybody to vote. And uh, Kyra, just just the planning and policy members. Right, correct. Can I, can I say something before we vote, just as a yes. comment? Okay, now I'd just like to say that I think that I, I appreciate the staff uh, really looking at where we are looking at the projects we have to postpone, but at the same time realizing that we have a little wiggle room to do what we're doing here to help people get through this thing, at the same time giving them incentives to start early uh, on these payment plans to pay it back. And um, with the reinstitution of the fees in October and the terminations from non payment in January seems to really give them that incentive to go ahead and get this plan started now so that they can make sure they get the money that's out there 
And I agree with Alan, we really have to do a good job of the media uh, in two, twofold. One is that the people know and understand so that they can go ahead and get started on these plans. And number two, so that the public in general understand what we're doing. And um, I think those are very key points. So anyway, that's, why I, support, that's yeah. why I support what the staff is doing. Yeah, we appreciate that. Uh, well said. Roll call. Yes. 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 To you now. Well, thank you um, for that. And we will um, start working towards, or actually not start, continue working towards, we're already uh, doing a lot of work in the background trying to get ready for this. And so I, I do think it's important to make sure that our customers are notified, as has been mentioned, and we're giving them the proper notification. So we'll definitely, um, you know, start doing that and putting that, publicizing that that information. Okay. And okay. Courtney, you, you want to move right on into the cross connection control? Yes. Please? Yes. Okay. Uh, yes, sir. Okay. So uh, Mike Stover is going to go over this section. Good morning, commissioners. Uh, as many of you may recall, uh, North, the North Carolina Administrative Code had changes that took effect regarding cross connections last July 1st, 2019. In November of 2019, the commission adopted a revisions to the water system policy resolutions to align with these new requirements. And since that, since November, the hydrant meter and tank permit application processes have been in effect. So since November of 2019, we've, we've learned a few lessons. Um, we've had growing pains with the development and construction community understanding the new requirements. Uh, we've had concerns over the fees being high. We've had concerns over the frequency of the application periods compared to other utilities. So what we've done, our staff, Tommy's done a great job. He's reached out to our peer utilities across the state. You can see down below, we've reached out to High Point, Greensboro, Davidson Water, City of Durham, Davie County Water, and Charlotte Water and Raleigh Water. And what we've concluded, everybody's doing things a little differently, but overall our fees are we found the fees to be high, and we found that our time frames are more restrictive than others. So, Section 17 of the Water Policy uh, Resolution, we have uh, we've taken what we've learned over the past several months, and we've got some proposed changes we want to get you know buy in from you guys on. This slide right here is just strictly for hydrant meters. The next slide will be for tanker permits. So, if you remember. Um, Right now, our policy, the hydrant meters, you come in, you, you can pay $3,000 uh, every three months for a refundable deposit and a $500 non-refundable application fee. Uh, compared to other utilities across state, that $3,000 deposit uh, is, is significantly higher than other, other utilities around the state. And at the time when we set that deposit, it was intended to cover the cost of the hydrant meter if it was damaged. That hydrant meter, you can see in the bottom right of this slide, is a three inch meter with a built in reduced pressure zone um, backflow. And it costs about $2,400. So, what happens now, customers come in, they, they pay the $500 non refundable application fee, they pay the $3,000 deposit. And then at the end of the 90 days, their um, their water usage comes off of that $3,000 deposit. And if there's no damage, they subtract the water us usage and get the, the balance back. What we are recommending is reducing that deposit down from $3,000 to $1,500 and increasing the application period from every 90 days to, to every six months or twice a year. The $500 non-refundable application fee, we are recommending to remain the same. Any, any questions with this one? I think this is the last slide, then, then we, we can take additional questions. 
<clears throat> this slide is for the tanker tanker permits. Does somebody have a question? We can, we can come back to it. That's fine. Okay. Go. Mm -hmm. So th this is for the tanker permit uh, process. Right now, um, it's five hundred dollar non refundable application fee, uh, which will remain the same, and then a seven hundred fifty dollar bulk water fee, which will remain the same. The, the big change here is extending the application period from every six months to once a year. Wes, you got a question? Yeah, I do. Back to the hydrant, Peter. So what's the reason for making the change? Is it just because everybody else is doing it? Is it, is well, this, is this, is it not working or is, or is it? I think the problem, process in general is working very well. The, okay. the, the concerns we're having is the uh, deposit are too, is too high and the application period is, is too frequent. So they're having to come in four times a year right now under our current um, policy and apply for this um, application. And they're not getting, if there is a, a refund on their deposit, they will not get that back until after they uh, apply for the, the new application. So you're talking about $3,500 four times a year, and uh, we're getting some, some pushback from the contracting development community on that. So I think, I, I think in my mind, the, the idea of increasing the application period is, is, is okay, but I guess it seems like the $3,000 is, see, when before we had a problem with people not bringing them back and, you know, and so, you know, they were keeping them out there too long. We didn't know where they were and trying to get them back. And there was an issue with that. So this in itself sounds like it's starting to work. I mean, is that right or no? By having the $3,000 versus what we had before. I, I think it, it, it is working. Um, you know, our staff sets these meters up and breaks them down. So the contractor or the developer that's using these meters, they don't have the ability to, to move these meters around. So we have a little more control on getting them that's back. Right. That's right. Um, and, and to be honest with you, that's why we, we're only extending it to every six months and not once per year. Uh, we wanna keep that time limit still somewhat short um, so we can keep control of where they're at. Mm -hmm. Now I like, but, the six, but, I like the six months idea. I mean, I, that to me, I guess that makes sense. Uh, I just reducing it down. I don't know the big any advantage of doing that per se. Well, Mr. Curtis, I'll tell I'll tell you the reason why we're proposing that. Okay. Uh, two two reasons. One, we looked across the state at, at the utilities I, I mentioned in the previous slide, okay. and the highest um, deposit for a three inch meter that we could find was twelve hundred twenty dollars in the city of High Point. So you know we we are charging almost three times that. And uh, the, the original intent was to cover the cost of that uh, hydrant meter and, and, and backflow in the event that it was not turned back in or it was damaged. Mm -hmm. right. our, uh, our staff is working on a price sheet to handle those type of things. If, um, if it doesn't get returned or if it gets returned and it's damaged, somebody will not be able to apply for a new application until they make us whole. All right, let me, do I understand that we're installing the hydrant meter, is that correct? That's correct. We set it up, uh, Tommy, correct me if I'm wrong, we set it up one time or we break it down one time. Right. We're not doing it every day like was was originally uh, right. planned. The, are we, have we experienced any damage to the new meters that we've been putting out there? Tommy? Tommy, can you answer that? You might have to unmute yourself. Yes, we've had uh, one hydrant meter get damaged. Um, the damage came up to $440. So you were able to repair it, Tommy? Yes, we've got the parts on order. Um, and, and to address the uh, the issue about the hydrant meters, as Mike said, moving around, if I may, when we install these meters, we're actually locking them to the hydrant. So it, a customer has to come back to us. We're not losing any. We're, we're keeping so, track of them. Okay. So the, meet, the meter is about $2,400. Mm -hmm. We're getting 3,000. 
and we've only had one that we've had out that's been damaged and you were able to repair it for 400 and some dollars. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Wes, that might be, you know, the reason in my mind anyway that we would go down is that we really, $3,000 is $600 more than the cost of the whole meter. And uh, they'd have to literally destroy it uh, to be able to, and I guess at that point, Mike, if somebody really tore one all to pieces, uh, do you have any ability to be able to recover in another way the, the cost of that particular meter if it exceeds the $1,500? Does that make any sense? Well, yeah, I think that's what, what I, we were talking about earlier, the, the price sheet Tommy's working on. He, he's working on a price sheet that, that covers the cost of each part, the meter, the backflow, the, the uh, you know, any coupling. Um, in any point need that that meter, they're gonna make us whole. And so far so, in the past year, I, I don't think we've had a, a major issue with that. Okay. Are are you saying that you want to propose to include uh, in addition to $1,500, uh, some language that covers if they damage it in some way, we repair it, that they paid a repair cost? Is that what we were doing? You're yes, saying if it goes over, <clears throat> excuse me, if it goes over the $1,500 with right. their water consumption and the damage, that they could right. potentially be out of pocket even more. They could have to owe us more. Do you need us? Uh, there's nothing in the proposal that speaks to that, does that need to be included in this? It, it's not in here, but we were gonna put it in the resolution and, and highlight it next month when we bring it to the uh, commission for approval. So let me ask you this, on average, since the usage actually comes out of the deposit, on average, are you really getting, are they getting anything back? You know what I'm saying? You, you, you have a deposit of 3,000 and by the time they have the usage of the meter, you know, and you're deducting the usage, I guess, from that deposit, at the end of the day, are most people getting money back or you, they're still owing what's, you money anyway? What's the average usage, Mike? Tommy, do you, do you know that answer? Uh, no, sir, I do not. The, the highest usage that we've seen has been in the $2,200 range. Okay. So, so we don't read any instance where the usage exceeds the three thousand dollar deposit. No, sir. Okay. Well, let, let me ask you: Do you net the usage against the three thousand dollars, or do you bill separately for the usage and keep the three thousand deposit as is? The, the usage. I, I don't know the answer to that, but I think if the in this case, if the um, usage exceeds the fifteen hundred dollars, we would bill them on top of that. Oh, so, so what I'm trying to understand is the billing. The, the billing, when they put that $3,000 down now, they get refunded less the amount of water they used? Correct. It's netted to, so the 3,000 is, is, is an escrow for billing as much as anything else. Correct, indeed. Okay, I, I got it, yeah. So if we reduce the three, I mean, I, I'm fine. I hear what, what you're, everyone's saying. If we reduce the 3,000 down, why wouldn't we reduce it down to actual cost of the meter? I think just to be more in line with the other utilities across the state. Okay. Um, okay. All right. And then the, another key point with both the hydrometer meter and the tanker permit, you know, the thing that we've really come to realize over the past year, the, the, the key, the most important part of this program is compliance. And we want to encourage compliance through one of these two mechanisms. And we don't want our fees to be so high that people are going around the system and just willing to, you know, get in trouble for five hundred dollars a day rather than paying the, the appropriate fees. Sure, sure. Okay. All right. Any, any other questions? I, 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 this is Courtney. I also, want, I just want to add this. I know we you typically 
typically don't see us asked to reduce fees. <laughs> We're usually looking to increase fees. Um, but at the beginning, when we were setting these fees last year at this time, there was you know changes to the the regulations um, regarding cross, cross control, and so other utilities were trying to react to this new program and these new requirements as well. So we really didn't have a good. Um, we didn't. All the other our peer utilities didn't have programs in place to be able to really compare ourselves. They were still working on their programs. So now that now that other utilities have their programs in place, we can better compare ourselves. And we just want to make sure that we're developer friendly, sure. uh, construction, you know, friendly yeah. here. So we can, we're encouraging that to happen here. And that, yeah. so I, I guess it, it is, you're, you're absolutely right. In the fact we don't want to lose money. Um, and if we see that we are, we may come back again and say, okay, well these, maybe we set them too low. Um, but no, no, I agree. and I agree. I think it's, I, for, for that reason alone, the idea that we are trying to be uh, utility friendly to our to our developers, I think is a is a plus. And so, if that's in line with our peers, that's a plus. And I think that the fact that, as you said, the last time we made these changes, the idea that we were losing meters now is not the case, because we are actually going out there hooking them up, and nobody can take them and lose them. So. That's not an issue. So the and you've experienced for the past year, nobody's. I mean, we're not losing money. I mean, so it sounds like everybody's being, being playing fair and playing nice. And so whether that's the result of wanting that deposit back or not, I don't know. But if you know, if we feel like it's, if it's a if it's a good idea to reduce to be more user friendly, more utility friendly, then I guess that's a value. So I'm fine with that. I guess I'm fine with that. Courtney, I would assume also, as you said, I think a while ago, that if over the next year or whatever time period we realize that there's an issue that we need to adjust and maybe go to the $2,400 or whatever, that y'all would bring that back at that point. Correct. Yeah. Uh, I would assume also that this item is going to need to go to the full commission. Is that Yes, this item will need to go because it's a policy resolution change. Right. So it will go to the full commission. So I guess we need a motion uh, to approve this change. And I, I think I want to make sure that the change includes the additional language that we talked about a while ago. Is that correct? Correct. Yes. And that'll go to the October commission meeting. Okay, brother, brother, uh, Mr. Ch uh, brother, <laughs> Mr. Chairman, <laughs> I'm thinking, I'm <laughs> uh, Mr. Chairman, I will make that motion for approval. Okay, we got a second. I second, Dwayne. All right, Dwayne. All right. Uh, I guess we need to get Kyra to uh, give us a call, roll call on the vote. Yes. 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 Okay, appreciate that. Now, Courtney's got one other item that we've got about 20 minutes, Courtney. Yeah, yeah so I'm hoping this one, um, <clears throat> I've really just got one slide, so um there is a section in our water system policy resolutions regarding resale of water so it's the resale of a, a leaseor to a leasee so if you can imagine an apartment complex or a condominium complex where we have a master meter and then the owner of that uh, complex wants to sub meter the units um there's uh the way it's written now is that the the owner has to get approval from the director to be able to submeter and there's these conditions ultimately they have to go through the north carolina utility commission um, for approval and so it's a minor change to to our policies kind of removing us from any kind of um auditing or monitoring of that really that holds with the North Carolina Utility Commission. So as long as we're in compliance with them, then I think, you know, our, our 
our um, what we need to do uh, should just fall under that. So basically, right now, the way it re reads, it says director shall confirm that a certificate of authority has been issued to the lease or by the North Carolina Utility Commission. So basically, if somebody wants to resell water in our system, they need to make that known to the director, to the utility, and we'll check to make sure that it's been approved by the North Carolina Utility Commission, and then they're good to go. Um, that has to be in accordance with the uh, North Carolina General Statutes, Article 6, Chapter 62, Section uh, 110 GHI, which basically is a, um, a general statute that doesn't really involve us since we're not in the business of submetering, um, but it's for leasors to leasing of, of submetering units. What we want to remove is that the operator of the, the system shall provide annually a statement of revenue gen generated by the resale of water. Um, they're providing that to the North Carolina Utility Commission. We don't really need to monitor that or have any control or authority over that. As long as they're, like as I mentioned earlier, as long as they're, you know, in compliance with the, the North Carolina general statute, then, then they're good with us. So we like to remove that requirement that they're submitting that information to us. It's, it's not needed. Um, the other thing that we like to remove is that all the meters used by the operator of the system must comply with the American Water Works Association. C700 or C701 specifications for potable water meters. Again, it's not really something for us to monitor. Uh, it's monitored under the North Carolina Utility Commission. So as long as they're in compliance with that, there's no reason for us to have that in our our policies. And, and basically what I wanna make sure is that we don't conflict. So I hate, I don't wanna put anything in our policies and then the, the North Carolina Utility Commission changes something and we don't, and then we're in, in, in conflict. So um, basically, as long as they're in compliance with the general statute, then they're good with us. Courtney, have we confirmed that the state has regulations related to the type of meters that they use? I looked at um, the general statute and, and it does not, I don't know what kind of approval process they go through um, at the state level. Um, I don't hey, remember it specifically mentioned that. Yes, Damon, Damon, know? Damon, Damon knows. Okay. Yeah, yeah uh, good afternoon or good morning. What, good day, how's that, <laughs> good day. Um, so to answer your, your question, Chairman, yes. If they're gonna be a purveyor of water, they fall under the same requirements that we do and so they would be a purveyor of water under the general statute, and so all the regulatory requirements would apply, um, including the one you just asked about. Okay. Okay. How many uh, instances, this is Randall, how many instances is, do we have in our system like this? So I think there's more than we know of. <laughs> um, uh, there's uh, probably 10 or so that we have on file, and I've, it's recently come up where people are asking for our permission and to, to resell water. And, and basically, as long as they're, as, you know, as long as they're in compliance with the general statute, then they're, and, and they just notify us, notify us. We wanna know where, where the locations are, um, then it's good. But I, I would say we probably have a hand, we have a list of about 10 or so. And they can mark up our rates? They can mark up the rates, yes. There's a, there's a limit, there's a there's a max, and that's what the North Carolina General Stat, that's what the North Carolina Utility Commission monitors. They can, can only mark it up so much, they can only charge a certain administrative fee. Um, okay, can, you give, can, can you give an example of a type of business or entity that would do that? Yes, so if you had a condominium complex uh, that we master meter, and then there's individual units, um, that complex, instead of paying for the water out of the, you know, the HOA account, they could sub-meter it and then, um, you know, individually meter those units. And then those, the, the tenants of those units would pay into the HOA per, you know, according to how much water they use. Uh, so, Courtney, uh, this is Chris. Under that scenario you just had, so we are responsible to getting the water to the master meter. Correct. And then beyond the master meter is a responsibility of someone else. Correct. Now, 
if are there situations where we would be responsible to bringing it all the way to the individual condos? Or, I, or, are I in these condos and apartments, do they typically have a master meter and then they go from there? So typically they have, we have a master meter and then it's private, you know, plumbing to each individual meters. And so at that point it becomes the, a, a private homeowner or, or owner situation. So do we do any testing of water in those entities and those establishments? I would just hate to think that, you know, they're not using the appropriate equipment and there's lead in the water. I wouldn't want that to fall back on us. So we, so we, we have our normal um, protocols as far as lead and copper testing. Um, we have certain areas that are in the private homes or businesses where we test for lead and copper. I, I can't say for sure if one of these condominium complex is on our list. It could very well be, um, but but yeah, we'd still have to follow all, all of our normal protocols. It's, uh, regarding the lead and copper rule. It, it, Courtney, you, this, is, this is Damon again. I was, I'm sorry to interrupt, Commissioner. The answer to that is it, no. It, you know, if we're doing it unknowingly, we should not be. Um, we should only be testing in areas that we are the water purveyor. So, for example, if there's a master meter, we should not be testing beyond that master meter. If there's no master meter, like a residential house, we would test then for our system. So the, the places that we know of that are water purveyors under the general statute through the State Utility Commission, they fall under they fall under the same, they have to have an operator, a licensed operator with the state. They're basically operating a very tiny water distribution system for their complex. So they would be responsible for doing all of those things. The reason we don't want to test on the side of a private purveyor is probably pretty obvious is if they're doing something on that side, like say you just talked about cross connection control, if they have some type of issue over there, we don't wanna be held accountable for that. Um, so in all the instances that we know of, we do not sample beyond a master meter. Well, Damon, I, I can foresee a situation where a, a citizen living in a condo is smelling their water and thinks it's spunky and they call us and say my water's and we don't know whether it's metered or unmetered the staff doesn't and they'll go out and go in the house and possibly test the uh, water i mean that's something that we've done and so i, I could see us getting into one of those situations unknowingly uh, as we're doing our normal thing Yes, sir, there, there is the potential for that, but I, I, will, um, I will say that has come up over the years, especially in my tenure here. And what we've done is you know, just notified the resident that they need to contact the property manager. And if they have further issues, that we can put them in direct contact with the State Utility Commission. And well, so that's how, that's how we've handled it in the past. Right, well, I, I wouldn't disagree with that. I, I guess, Courtney, another question that I've got is, uh, you've got a list of 10. Uh, does the state keep a list of these systems in our? They area? should be, and that's a yeah. good question. I mean, and, 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 and list. exactly, yeah, because I'm, I'm sure there's more than what we know about, and there could be some that the state doesn't know about, you know. Um, Not sure. Unfortunately, that's, but, um, we can definitely call the the state utility commission to see if there's a if there's a list that's within our area that we can get a copy of. Okay. I, I guess, uh, particularly folks on the committee, what what we're really interested in is um, the fact that in our current uh, policies we've got us. Uh, saying that those folks have to report to us and that we're giving them certain requirements as to the type of meters they use when in fact we probably need to distance ourselves from them i guess is what you're doing courtney and wanting to remove these two doc two statements yes that's correct that's absolutely correct any I'm, any I'm, other comments about this i've got I've, 
I've got one on the side. There seems to be some uncertainty about what we own and what we don't own. <laughs> Has there ever been an inventory of all these meters and some kind of uh, master list of, of where we stop at a meter instead of going into a condominium association? Anything like that? Yeah, so we have our GIS system and then obviously our billing system where we have all of our meters and uh, accounts. So we know typically there's some there's always some odd situations, but typically we we um, maintain up to the meter for any business um, residential property. And and after that, it becomes private property. Well, my question goes back to what Damon mentioned, that there may be some of those places where we've gone in and tested water within an association where it wasn't our responsibility. Someone going in the field, can they tell those kind of things? They know where to stop. I'll answer that. Um, <laughs> yes, yes, they can. And um, okay. it, it would be extremely rare it's probably after hours late on a holiday that we would sample by accident on a private system. Um, the, the personnel in the field can usually tell, A, like Courtney said, by the information that's contained on the screen in the GIS. And they also, the first thing they do is look for the meter to the development. And um, it, it's all really well documented, especially okay. in the last five or so years, we have really good data. So any field tech should be able to look at their screen and almost be able to tell instantaneously whether it's private or public. Okay. Yeah, I, I was going to say that uh, if anything, seems like the state ought to give us a list of those persons. But the bottom line is, we know where our meters stop. That's right. Period. So you right. know, with that, we know you know where to go and where not to go as far as what's out there. Okay. Hey, Courtney, this is Chris. You had mentioned something about. Uh, concern about an audit and being in line with with an audit. Do, do we have some type of issues on, on this with a recent audit? Well, I, may, I probably said it wrong. I just don't think what I'm trying to do is remove ourselves from auditing what's out there. Like, for example, where the third statement, I say remove that they have to provide us an annual statement of revenue generated by the resale of water. We really don't want to be in the position where we're auditing what they're doing, the resale of the water. And, and so it's really just removing ourselves from any kind of responsibility regarding that. Okay. Okay. Any other comments, questions? I assume that since this is a uh, proposed change, uh, that this will have to go to the full commission also. Yes. Motion. So moved. Second. This is Wesley Curtis. Dwayne made a motion. Okay, we've got a motion and a second. Uh, Kyra, if you'll take a vote, I'd appreciate it. Yes. 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 Anything else? That that's all we had for you today. <laughs> Any other comments from anybody? Need a motion. Motion so to adjourn. And second, <laughs> uh, is that unanimous? Do we gotta have a roll call on that too? <laughs> I, think, I think we're good, but Marilena will stop me if we're no, not. No, yes, uh, yes, roll call, please. <laughs> Tom, I thought I thought you were gonna get away with it. Sorry, <laughs> and no thumbs up either. Thank you. <laughs> I won't say no. I, uh, I'm not. I want to keep, I want this going, go ahead. Yeah. Let me think about it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. 
Okay, well, we are adjourned. Thank you for your time today. Thank you. Well done, everybody. Take care. Bye. 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 Good job, Stan.